Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our another Facebook Live workshop. Okay, for today, ask me, ask Charlie anything. We're going to talk about understanding autism with Nurul Diana. She's our in house clinical psychologist. So today, we're going to talk about uh, autism from the perspective of a clinical psychologist. Okay, these are our following uh, workshop, our upcoming workshop. Uh, next will be an a Facebook Live as well, Balancing and Coordination by, uh, by our occupational therapist, Ms. Alia. And then we have a, a guest speaker, Dr. Hanna from UKM. Uh, she, she is a dietitian. She's going to talk about diet and children with autism. All right. So before we start, uh, I would like to introduce about my story. So basically, for those who uh, follow us, they know that um, we are a... <clears throat> We provide services for children with special needs. Uh, special needs includes academic delays, sensory delays, developmental delays, behavioral and emotional difficulties, as well as physical delays. So our team is a multi, uh, multidisciplinary team, which consists of academic support, behavior therapies, clinical psychologists, a counselor, OT, reading therapy, uh, and speech and language therapies. Okay, you can contact us at this number. We provide free consultation. Okay, and you can check us out at Facebook, our community group, Facebook page, uh, LinkedIn, Mind Story, our website, as well as Instagram. Okay, let us welcome Miss uh, Rihanna. Hi, Rihanna. Hello, Charlie. Thank you for having me again. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, some topic that has been widely discussed. Okay, I believe uh, almost every month uh, there's definitely a talk about uh, autism okay so today in particular we, uh, it's good that we have a clinical psychologist here uh, to talk about autism to share with us uh, what's autism okay and what we're going to talk about uh, autism today so uh, firstly um, uh, what are the characteristics of uh, autism from your perspective all right, before I start with the characteristic, Charlie, I would just like to define what autism is, right? So autism oh. is autistic, uh, autism spectrum disorder or ESD, all right? So when we talk about autism, it's, a non, it's, it's, called, it's under neurodevelopmental uh, disorders, all right, in regards to the brain, right? So some people may ask, like, can, can my child develop autistic criteria after like certain years, all right? So basically that is um, a no because autism or ADHD or SLD or ID, those are all under neurodevelopmental disorders. So it has to happen after birth, all right? Because it regards to the brain, all right? There's imbalance uh, chemical uh, chem chemistry in the brain and whatnot. So that is how autism or neurodevelopmental disorders works. So you asked about what are the characteristics of autism, right? Yes. So the, 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 main, the main three things that we do want to look for autism or is, um, first is the social interaction, all right? So when it comes to social interaction, uh, we have uh, difficulties in terms of initiating um, interactions with other people or even interacting with other people. Most uh, children with autism, um, they develop an isolated play or they play by themselves. Even if you sit next to them and share and you want to share things with them, they would usually is either they would not want to play with the toy that you play or they just take the toy that they want to play and move further away from you. All right. Basically, there's no interaction. So sometimes parents would also ask, like, no, if my child is autism, where well, why is um what why why is it that I'm able to actually play with them? So we want to define how do you play with them, right? Because that is is one of the characteristics of autism. All right, because they usually have isolated play, right? So less uh, social interaction and whatnot. So that's the first criteria that we want to look at, which is social interaction. Second of all is the developmental milestones, right? Most um, autistic children have de uh, delayed developmental milestones, where, for example, delayed in speech, uh, delayed in fine motor skills, delayed in gross motor skills and whatnot, 
all right however that does not define the autistic alone so some people say that oh my child has delayed in speech so does that mean she or she is um, autistic all right so like i said it has to have three criteria that we want to look at first is social interaction second is uh and the third one is repetitive behaviors, all right? So repetitive behaviors or what we call steaming is one of the major characteristics of uh, autism, all right? So some people would see um, flapping hands, for example, so they would do this, all right? They would flap their hands uh, most of the time. Um, they don't have a time for them to flap. They would always flap whenever they feel like it, all right so it's not like oh my child flaps when um he or she is happy or excited all right so that means that is a reason for them to flap and sometimes it's just a face but if it's an autistic criteria they would flap uh, regardless of the timing or regardless of the reasons environment it is all right so one thing is flapping hands repetitive behaviors or steaming it can be rocking of the body back and forth all right, so back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, um, or knocking their head um, uh, on the wall, knocking their head um, on, the, uh, on the, right? So anything that has been done repetitively, all right? Um, there's no reason to it. It's just being done repetitively over and over again. And you can see it every single day, then that is considered as repetitive behaviors. So, like I said, the three, like you, uh, like what you asked, what are the criteria? Those are the three things, right? So, social interaction, um, developmental muscles, and also uh, repetitive behaviors, Charlie. All, All right. right. Hope okay. that answers. Yeah, it's very good. <laughs> well defined. Uh, if you have any question, uh, feel free to write in the comment so I can relate to uh, Miss Liana. So, uh, yes, the reason why I ask this is because uh, for me personally, I experienced a lot uh, when I met. When I meet parents, um, uh, sometimes they uh, have different characteristics, but uh, I'm not too sure uh, what are the characteristics or the criteria, uh, because it's defined by the clinical psychologist or uh, health professionals like developmental pediatrician. But what I know is as a clinical psychologist, these criteria fall under the psychosocial. Okay, for children, uh, but for the doctors, they have biopsychosocial means that they can rule out certain things uh, based on the biological factor, which is not uh, from uh, clinical psychologists. That's why I'm very curious about um, the characteristic or the criteria. How, how do we know as a lay person who are not in the clinical psychology field, uh, which is, is good because it really answers my my questions uh because i always wanted to know like there's so many things about uh, uh the characteristic like criteria because there's a lot nowadays it's we have access to a lot of information but we don't have the definite answer so it's really good that you pinpoint it down to three major or the three criteria that has to be met uh to consider a child to have an uh, autism uh, or to, uh, with a criteria to be uh, autism. Okay, so when you mention about uh, it's all ASD spectrum, it's a, like a wide spectrum, wide scale, right? So from there, how, how do you know like which spectrum is a child? Is, like... All right, so when we talk about autism spectrum disorder, right? It's within the spectrum itself. So when we need to understand what the spectrum means, it means it's a wide range, right? So how would you define uh, uh, the spectrum under the autistic level, right? So for you to understand the spectrum is a wide range. So for example, there's a child A has criteria of autism, autistic, right? Autistic criteria. And then child B also being diagnosed with um, autism, all right, but does not share similar criteria or characteristics of child A. And why is that so, all right? That because it falls under the spectrum that we mentioned, that you mentioned just now, all right? It's because that is a wide spectrum. It does not have, one person should not have all the criteria and it should not be defined as similar as the other person, all right? One person may have this and the other person may have that. 
all right for example just now i i explained about the uh, repetitive movements repetitive behaviors right so like i said there's flapping hands there's rocking movements of body all right there's a lot more criteria of that a lot more examples to that all right so let's say child a has flapping hands criteria all right and child b has probably the uh, back and forth uh uh, what would you call that? You you pour the water back and forth, back and forth, back and forth all the time. All right. So that's what I mean by spectrum. It is it does falls under the repetitive behavior, but it's not the same. It's not the exact same behaviors, right? Oh, okay. So so the, so, so the criteria talk about the yeah. level. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about the level as well, so they also differentiate between the spectrum as well. All right. Mm. So not only the criteria difference, it differs in terms of the level as well. All right. So certain certain level, certain certain impairments would be under the mild characteristics, and certain certain level would be under the moderate and also the severe part. Yeah. Okay. So I get it. So it really depends on the criteria. Uh, from that criteria, how how big is the impact, or how big is are the impacts on the child? Then only they will be placed in a spectrum of, you know, mild, severe, or, you know, moderate, or severe. moderate yeah, moderate, severe, because um, I've seen a lot of uh, reports, I, I get confused sometimes because um, uh, doctors will use level, level 1K, uh, level 2K, level 3K, some uh, who are really specialized, like especially developmental pediatrician, they will go for uh, the spectrum mild level, moderate, severe. So that's where I got confused that, so mm -hmm. how, how do you determine like a level one or level two K or level three K or mild? So thanks for the explanation. Now I know that from a clinical psychologist point of view, when you see a child with the criteria of autism, then from there you will further see how much is this criteria affecting the child, am I correct? And then exactly. From... So basically, how much the, the behaviors or the criteria impairing the child's life. So for example, if the behavior, repetitive behaviors is, is very harmful, for example, rocking the body or knocking the head on uh, towards the floor or towards the, the, the wall. So that is already harming himself. All right. Mm. So that would be probably under the higher spectrum. Ah. Yes. Okay. So it really determines, the, the, the criteria will determine uh, uh, the way you fall under the spectrum. Ah, okay. So, all right. So for those who are out there, uh, when we talk about uh, psychosocial, meaning that we see the person in terms of the psychological point of view, as well as the social, like what uh, Miss Liana has explained just now, the criteria is three. One is the behavior of uh, repetitive behavior with no uh, reason. You don't need to reason like, Right, like what she has shared, pouring water back and forth. There's no time, there's no reason behind it. You can't define uh, the, the action of pouring water back and forth. Uh, and then also have difficulty initiating interaction or socialize. Uh, I assume that they will, the child will tend to play alone uh, and not interacting with other child if you put them in a play setting. And then the second one would be social behavior and uh, what's, this, what's the third one? Yeah. Repet repetitive movements, uh, developmental milestones oh, and repetitive yes. behavior. So the developmental milestones. Developmental milestone will be uh, depending on the functions of like, for example, speech is not properly developed or not really functioning. Uh, that's where you, uh, is it possible for the child to have all these three criteria? Yes, it is possible, Charlie. So maybe probably if it is um, impairing most of the functionality, maybe it falls under the higher level of spectrum. Okay. So meaning that if they meet all the criteria and it's affecting their daily functioning, like going to school, brushing teeth, then it will fall on the severe side of the spectrum. Yeah, right. Okay. All right. So the, the reason why I ask this also because I, I really want to know uh, this criteria when it's met. Uh, then by determining uh, the level or the uh, which spectrum that they fall into, then we can roughly know uh, his the, the child's uh, functioning on a daily basis. So meaning that if yeah. the higher end, which is the severe, 
whereby these three criteria will be met. And also it's like whereby uh, the behavior of like head banging on the wall uh, and like speech would be, I assume would be as so well, there's a great delay in that. Okay, so mm -hmm. now I have a- So basically better... if, if, for, if, if for those who are in, in, the, in the severe side of it, they mm -hmm. would definitely need more care for them. Right? So that's differentiate also between level one, level two, and level three, or mild, moderate, and severe. The severe, the more severe part of the criteria, the more need, the more support that the child would need. Yeah. Mm. All right. So that's from there. That's the my where my next question will be. <laughs> uh, so it, for us to know the criteria, then it definitely we're gonna talk about diagnosis. Okay. So uh, because. In the diagnosis, this is where it will list out the criteria. Am I correct? Yes, you're right. You're okay. right. So, uh, because for me, uh, from what I know from doctor's perspective, they have a standardized uh, assessment. Okay. So, but for clinical psychologists, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, they have few assessment. Am I correct? Yes, yes, you're right, Charlie. Yeah. So in terms of the assessment for clinical psychologists, right? So we use CARS or GARS, all right? So that is basically to rule out this, the, the, the autism spectrum disorder, all right? So we have that for, and also we sometimes we include um, IQ tests as well, especially for those who are who diagnosed at the age of six and above. So it means that they have went to school, but then they have difficulties going to schools, right? probably um, managing themselves at school or um, having a great delay in, in terms of understanding, right? So probably the criteria is not as severe, all right, or it's not as obvious, all right, but um, it's been affecting. So mm -hmm. with that, we would use IQ, IQ, IQ assessment as well, just to check whether if the child is able to go to a mainstream school, Right mm -hmm. means that the criteria is mild. So if the child is, is able to go to the mainstream school, so what are the supports that the child needs from the school and can the school provide? If the school could not provide the, 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 the support that the child needs, probably the parents would have to consider other schools or probably the schools need to adapt or change certain things for the needs of the child. Yeah. Okay. All right, so you mentioned CAS and CAS. Okay. It, that's the abbreviation right for mm -hmm. g-a-r-s and c-a-r-s yes okay so for those who are out there if you're looking for an assessment uh, from a clinical psychologist for autism uh, you can look for this name c-a-r-s cas or g-a-r-s can you briefly explain because i know there's a lot of technical terms which we will have a hard time understanding can you briefly go through like uh, what why there's two Okay, hold on. Eh? Just, just let me, let me, I forgot the, the, the full word. Okay, C-A-R-S. Um, so basically, there's, there's two because it's from a different publisher. All right, so there's one, um, it's, uh, oh dear, I really forgot. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. Uh, all right, so basically, yeah, there's there's um, two because of different publisher. So if we talk about uh, cars or cars, it's si quite similar between the two. It depends whether it's not greater than the other. It's quite similar. So some centers and some hospitals use prefer to use cars, C E R S, but some prefer to use G A R S. So it's quite it's, it's, it's okay. There's no difference differentiation. No one is greater than the other. So it's okay to it as long as you know that that assessment is particularly to diagnose or to assess autism. Okay. Yep. All right. So, uh, to all, including me, to all outside, if you're looking for uh, autism assessment, there's no differences in terms of like one is. Cars is better than gas. Gas is better than cars. It's really depend on, uh, I would say, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. uh, the preference and the comfortability of the, uh, the clinical psychologist or the organization. So, and both yeah. develop to detect uh, the criteria of uh, autism. It's just that they are developed by different publisher or different organizations. Yes. Both are useful. 
Okay, and also you mentioned that after doing this assessment, uh, you give it an example of a student uh, where if the child is above six years old, then they will go for IQ test. So for my question is, do you have an edge limit on this autism assessment? Sorry, what was that? Do you have an edge limit? Because Age uh, limit. Yes. How, how, how young can you detect by using this uh, autism assessment? All right, because I'm familiar with CARS, so C-A-R-S, that is, okay, I found it, it's Childhood Autism Rating Scale. <laughs> All right, so for CARS, it's from um, uh, one and a half, so basically from two years old, we take it, all right, from two years old and above. All right. So for um, um, IQ tests, we require from six years old and above. All right. Mm. So for a child, for those who are, are under six years old, wanted to diagnose or to rule out autism, who we'll go for cars alone, not with IQ tests. All right. Like I said, why IQ test is uh, sometimes is necessary because you have the child has entered the school age. All right. So be able, being able to go for kindergarten and whatnot, preschool and whatnot. So being able to adapt, but somehow has limitations during the, the primary school. So that's why we add on the IQ test to help them develop or to help them understand, to, to, to help understand how they learn and how their abilities and to work with their strengths and weaknesses for them to, 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 to better learn in school. Okay. So that's why sometimes IQ test is a need accompanied by cars. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this, the age limit for cars, C-A-R-S, will be one and a half years old. Oh, one and a half to two years, yeah. We say we take two years old, yeah. All right. While the intelligent test, the minimum age is six. Okay. Six years old, that's right. Ah, all right. So I see there's a pattern of diagnosis, meaning that uh, let's say if my child, I will send for screening for uh, autism, then after that, there will be follow up with other diagnosis to further find out uh, the difficulties. Am I correct? And so one if of them, your, mm -hmm. yeah, so if your child is under six years old, then we would we just do um, cars alone. But if there are developmental milestones um, related to it, then we would also recommend for VAPS. For VAP is binding adaptive behavior skill. So that one could identify. In, for example, there's a lot of um, um, domains, for example, communication, socialization, behaviors and whatnot. So those we need to understand in those developmental milestones, where does the child level is, right? So we need to identify which one's level, whether it is sufficient or adequate to their age, or if it's under, if it's over, what is it? So for us to help and to, to help those uh, to identify what are the therapy needed for later for the child. Ah, okay, I understand. So uh, to everyone out there who joined us today, uh, including myself, it will be a separate uh, assessment. Okay, I thought it was all in one. Okay, my bad. <laughs> so it will be cast to determine only if the child has a criteria or meet the criteria of autism. Yes. And then you will do a further assessment. For example, you mentioned that fine adaptive skill, which yep. is VAPS, if I'm not mistaken. VABS. VABS, sorry. Yep. Oh, adaptive behavior, VABS to determine the functioning level of the behavior or other adaptive Develop skills. Mass. Correct. So, GAS will be one assessment. VABS for the milestone, developmental milestone, will be another assessment. Okay. All right. And if, uh -huh. if, if it's needed for six and above, IQ test. Uh, so, this is all separate uh, assessment yes. to find out yes. each of the function. They have their own uh, specialty. Okay, exactly. all right. So VABS will be on develop, developmental milestone. Okay, to all the uh, people that attend uh, the, the workshop, I mean, just uh, uh, join us today. Uh, development milestone means that uh, the child uh, at certain age, they, are, they have to have expected uh, skills. Am I correct? Yes, that's right. So according to KTM, there are certain, at every age, every age level, at each group, you have to have meet a certain criteria.
criteria or certain criteria of developmental milestones that you need to follow. When you don't meet or you don't reach the uh, the, the age uh, criteria, the age milestones, then that means if your child may be underdeveloped. So oh. we need to give focus on that. Yeah. So, so chronologically, the child can be nine or seven or eight, but uh, if they have difficulties, meaning that uh, their skills or their expected developmental age will be under age. Yes, okay. so that's if, right. So meaning that there's a gap between the real age and their developmental age. Okay. All right. So for yes, those who join right. us today, uh, that's what if you if you very familiar with it, you if you see doctors or you know if you are working in this field, uh, a lot of them will use this term developmental milestone. Okay, developmental milestone is like what uh, uh, Ms. Liana has talked about, which is, uh, you know, a certain age, the child ex has an expectation to meet uh, a, a certain maybe skills or speaking or like, uh, like uh, your speech has to be, you know, at this age, they're supposed to have uh, or expected to have certain skills of talking or speaking. And then maybe... Uh, uh, they have a certain understanding. If not, that's where you have another assessment for like IQ test to know. Okay, all right, that's that's very good. And we talk about the uh, the, the the age as young as one and a half years old. What about the highest? How old can it go for CAS for CARS? For CAS, if I'm mistaken, is until sixteen or seventeen, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. All right, so for those who are looking for autism uh, assessment, especially CARS, which is what Ms. Liana is, uh, her preference of using that assessment. So the age is about one and a half years old to 16. Okay, all right. And then um, I'm curious to how long is this assessment? Because uh, I assume that it's going to be like the question A, right? So you will yes. be... Can I know like how what, what's the process? Would you uh, ask the parents or you will uh, like how does it look? Okay, so um, I think for those who have followed us um, in the previous uh, seminar, I did explain how do we want to diagnose the process of diagnosing, right? Mm -hmm. So first level is once we would call it uh, the consultation or intake interview, all right? So that's where I would ask whether if this child presented with these symptoms, symptoms, symptoms and criteria and whatnot, just for as a screening part for me to decide whether to proceed with CARS or with binding this or with whatever, right? So I would determine based on the interview intake first, all right? Wow. So that's the first consultation session. So after that, if I uh, usually... Uh, for the interview or uh, intake interview session, that would already take up around one hour to one hour and a half. All right. So the next session will come is with the uh, if the, the child needs to have the cars, for example. So that would be a semi structured interview. So we have a list. I would have a list of questions um, whether to see whether the, the the behavior is presented or displayed, uh, whether it's frequent or not, whether the child has difficulty doing this or the child does not have difficulties. So I would interview parents with that. So basically with just the parents itself. All right. Okay. And then after doing all that, that would usually take around one hour. All right. One hour session. Then I would also ask the parents to come back again. And this time I would do observation. All right. So observation would take around 30 to 45 minutes. It depends on the child. All right. Sometimes it lasts even an hour just to observe whether if the characteristic of the autism is presented while I was interacting with them or not. All right. Like, for example, when I would, when I would do the observation um, session, I would uh, look at the three main things I mentioned just now. Right, the social interaction part, and then the developmental milestones, and then the repetitive behaviors. All right, so that will be observed during the the observation session. All right, and then I would determine whether if uh, the mom or the parents would want to proceed with the developmental milestones because it's not it's not a need, but it is an option, a very good option for you to take. All right, for to, to do the assessment as well. At least we would know at what age. Although, like you said just now, Charlie, uh, chronological age is between the real age, like, for example, certain years and certain months, certain days, right? So that's a chronological years, that's the chronological age for the child. 
but we want to know the, the developmental milestone is up to the chronological age or is it under or is it over? So we need to know that, all right? So that, that would help us to actually understand better whether to decide whether those, uh, the, the abilities are affecting or not, all right? So sometimes parents would say that, oh, my child couldn't do, couldn't um, pick up certain objects or my child couldn't, uh, couldn't do certain things with the fingers. Then that is referring to the FMS, which is a fine motor skills, which is being observed or being um, screened in the VAPS, binding adaptive behavior milestones, right? So that is why we need to do all that. Just to explain to parents, this is why we see that your child is unable to do certain things. So that gives a little bit more further explanation to the parents to understand better of their developmental milestones and how it affects in their daily routine as well, all right? So for example, if the child is under six, then I would stop there and then would brief the report, uh, for example, another two weeks. So if the child is six and above, then I would ask the parents, or I would recommend for the parents to proceed with the IQ test. And that would take with the child itself for two hours in the next session. So if we don't lump up all the session in one go because that will be tiring for the parents will be tiring for the child will be tiring for me as well <laughs> so we would have to separate the sessions as well all right accordingly yes okay all right that's very detailed okay <laughs> so uh, basically how long or what's the process it's all together i assume okay uh just for the autism uh, assessment itself, it's divided into few processes uh, or different uh, stages or different sessions. So the first session will be uh, a pre prelim meet or preliminary meeting with parents uh, just to get to know them. Uh, and then whether yes or no, it will be decided on that day. Am I correct? So how, how right. long is about how long is this prelim? So receiving consultation is usually to one, from one hour to one hour and a half. It really depends. Yeah. Okay. So this is without the child, right? Just the parents? Yeah, sometimes the parents do bring the child. So while, I, while I'm interviewing the parents, I would also observe the child as well. So I would sometimes like point out, oh, is this behavior normal? Or does this child do this behavior often? So just to get a clear cut whether if the whatever the information that's given by the parents is portrayed uh, by the child at the same time. Yeah. Okay. So before the assessment day itself, there is initial uh, consultation or preliminary meeting just to understand the parents. So it takes about one to one and a half hours. Okay, that's how long it is. That's the first stage. And then after that, if the child, you determine that they need to go for an assessment, then it will go to a second session, which is the CAS or CARS assessment day itself. So during that assessment, you'll be, uh, okay, the first stage initial uh, consultation, it will be like interviewing. And if there's child there, then you can observe. Okay, that's the style mm -hmm. of initial, uh, I mean, that's your style of uh, doing the initial <laughs> consultation. The second session will be the assessment day itself. If you determine that on the first session, after the first session, that this child needs to have assessment. Then we go on to the assessment day, where second session will be uh, assessment day where you, uh, the style will be interviewing parents as well? Yes, sometimes yeah. um, parents would ask what, it, during the first inter inter uh, intervention, what, you already asked this type of question, why are you repeating it with the assessment? Like mm -hmm. for example, in the cars, right? Why I'm doing it because I want during the first intervention, uh, first consultation session, I would want to know whether this behavior is developed because of neglectance, negligence from the parents, or is it because of the developmental milestones delayed from the child itself? So that's why I need to have the similar question when I have for the cars. So basically, the first session is just to screen out and to understand whether that behavior or that um, that that, that um, milestones or development is because is caused by the negligence of the parents or the lack of social interactions probably from the, the, the environment. Is that because of the environment and the parents or is it because of the developmental neurological uh, neurodevelopmental issues? So that's why I need to have those. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. So for those who are listening, including me, uh, 
please don't get stressed out because that's on her side. It looks busy, but not on, on us. Basically, if we were to attend, she just gonna ask us question, but what she explaining is from her point of view. Yeah. Okay, where she'll be, you know, observing, monitoring, uh, interviewing, and to find out more. So that's a part. So basically, the second one, sometimes you might find the same questions, but this is her, she, for her uh, to look at uh, the, to outline some, uh, or to clarify some of the questions that she had. So on the assessment itself, mostly uh, the clinical psychologist will work with the parents in terms of interviewing to get more information uh, to, and then uh, because these assessments, psychological assessment are mostly in terms of question A, okay? Uh, that's why, uh, I, I, and that's why I assume that parents is very important or the caretaker or primary caretaker, it's very important, which I will ask later, uh, but for now, uh, yes, that's why it's very important to have parents around on the second uh, observation or the assessment day itself because uh, it's really good to feedback uh, to uh, uh, the clinical psychologist like Christiana. And how long would this take? About one to one and a half hours? Uh, this will be usually the, uh, in one hour. Okay. All right. So then after that, uh, the, it will take you about two weeks to produce the report. Yeah, if that is just the the, the, the session, uh, means yeah. that there's no more addition to Vindin or IT test, then yes, two weeks after the course, then right. the report briefing session. Okay, so for all the viewers, uh, this is how long and how many uh, the process just on the autism assessment. Okay, uh, from her point of view, she'll take three sessions and about one hour each, each session. Uh, sorry, two session, uh, and two session, and uh, that's about uh, one to one and a half hours to determine. Okay, uh, and also she stated her reason whereby you know if you were to sit during the initial consultation or the prelim meeting, and then you have to follow up with um, uh, the assessment itself, then it will be quite tiring. It will take about three four hours. Okay, provided that there's no taking breaks, like oh, straight, you know, from the start until the end, there's no the break, there's no nothing, but it will be uh, tiring. And um, yeah, I, I don't think it's a good idea as well to sit through it. Uh, okay, so that's where we can move on to my next questions. Okay, and then because normally uh, I have parents asking me, so I got this assessment, what's next? What to do? So uh, from my understanding, from your explanation just now, uh, it's very thorough. I like it. It's very detailed because it's answered a lot of my uh, queries. You know, I have a lot of uh, uh, questions. Like it gets me interested. Like, wow, what do they do actually in the session? Because I can't be in the session. So thanks for explaining it. Uh, and then that's where after uh, the report, uh, after two weeks to produce the report, and then the this is, uh, I will say, the new session or follow up. Okay, either way, uh, up to you how we want to put it. Um, the following session after second day, uh, after second session, would be, you know, you have to discuss the result. Am I correct? Yeah. So this is yes, where. Yes, that would be correct. Yeah. So this is where Miss Liana will explain the result and uh, to recommend what's the next step. So, normally, uh, like she explained just now, if she found out that uh, the, the, the behavior or the, uh, what I call this, developmental milestone, there's a gap or she suspects there is a gap, that's where she'll recommend the next step is to do the VABS, okay, which is a Violent Adaptive Behavior Skills Assessment. This assessment itself is to find out uh, the, the delay, if this, the child has experienced the delay, which is to answer the question on the first assessment, correct? Um, usually, I do not wait until the report to come out first. I would explain to the parents why I want to, I want to do the gaps before I do the report so that they don't get separate report, they will get both 
uh, assessment in one report wow. that is easy ah. for you to refer. So I would also explain to yeah, so the parents why I want to do the VAPS um, before we do the result session is because mm. I see there's a development the master's during my observations. So those are the things that I need to explain to the parents and make them understand why it's important for me to do the VAPS or the IQ test, right? So I don't simply say, okay, I see that you need this, 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 this so we're going to do this, 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 so it comes in a package. So I don't do that. So <laughs> from my practice, I see that if I see it's necessary for the child to, to do this assessment, I would explain to the parents, okay, I need to do this assessment because of this, this is I need to see this, 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 so that I can explain in the report and back each other's. Um, for example, if I do VAPs and assess a, a card, so the result would actually support one another, right? Ah. So that's why I need to do both probably during the session. Yeah. Ah, okay, understood. So after the second uh, session, which is the autism CARS assessment, then the second one follow up will be either the parents, if this is all parents' choices, right? If they choose not to, then the third session will be just meet up and to explain what's next. Or mm -hmm. during the second session, when you recommend what's, what to do next, they can opt for it and go for the third session, which is observation on the particular area that need to be assessed on. For example, uh, what we call this the developmental milestone, which is the VAPS. Ah, now I see it. And then after that, then the report will be combined into one. And then you have two uh, types of uh, result, I assume. Will be yes, 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 right. that's right. Sometimes, uh, Charlie, um, I just want to add, sometimes parents would ask, probably in the viewers, they might want to ask that, why, if you see that that is necessary for the child to have assessment, why would you give the parents an option whether to have it or not, right? So from my perspective, I would have to understand from the parents' perspective as well, right? Sometimes doing uh, an assessment private sector is quite expensive, even for the first CARS assessment, right? So I would explain why or would I why would I need the second assessment, which is the VAPS, right? So sometimes VAPS is also costly. So I would ask whether if the parents would be uh, would be comfortable doing the session or doing the assessment at the at the same center or do the parents want to do it somewhere else, probably in the government hospital to do that. Right, mm. but then again, I would explain the pros and cons as well. All right, doing this here in the uh, private sector, what are the pros and cons, and doing in the government hospital, what are the pros and cons? So, I would give options to the parents to decide. Right, so I would always explain to them whether, regardless they have questions or not, I would always explain to them in details whether they know what are the decisions, what are the options that they take. So, not just yes, 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 and then go out of the session. Uh, I don't remember what Ms. Diana said just now. All right, so okay. I would explain. <laughs> And ask whether do you understand? Do you need my help in explaining? I could go over it again, and it's okay for that to happen. All right. Yeah. All right. So for all the viewers, uh, yeah. So basically, that's how long or the process all together. Okay. It can be two session. It can be three session. It, uh, it really did, uh, depends on uh, how many assessment or recommended assessment and what to be assessed on and please do ask your clinical psychologist because I do meet a lot of parents, you know, after assessment, they'll be like, or assessments, more than one, and then they'll be like, what's next? You know, all the written thing, I don't even understand. So please uh, do ask your clinical psychologist because uh, there's a lot of technical terms, okay? Uh, so that's where um, I also learning from clinical psychologists because some of the parents, when they come and see me, uh, I have almost zero clue on certain things because um, I study psychologists, but I am not a trained clinical psychologist. I'm a counselor. So for me, I do a very, very basic screening or assessment, but not really a complex psychological testing. So this is where I always recommend parents or um, I will ask on behalf of them, like, can you please explain? Uh, what, what's this result or what's the next one? Because normally after the assessment, like what uh, Ms. Liana say, she will recommend uh, certain things and she will explain to parents what to do next. So if it happened that um, your clinical psychologist say or did not say, feel free to ask, okay? 
uh, because you pay for it. Uh, it's really important because if you come to me or most of, most of the time I see parents, I wouldn't know what's next. Okay, because that, that particular um, uh, report is written by the clinical psychologist and they know uh, what they are writing. I, mean, I, I can read, I know, but I don't really know exactly uh, like the condition of the child we can see. It's very obvious, but there are certain recommendations based on that assessment itself. They have a, like mm -hmm. a, uh, a tailored to the child, what the child difficulties and when let's say uh, after uh, cars, there's a behavior, you'll do VABS. Under VABS, I assume that's a recommendation from them as well, right? Yes, yes, that's right. Okay, all right. And also, uh, Ms. Liana brought out something that uh, I want to talk about, cost. So this is where it's really good to ask, okay, uh, the clinics or psychological services, or hospital or private hospital, wherever you go, if you want to go for assessment, please do ask first. And then how do they judge? Okay, some, uh, they don't give you a report after the assessment. Why? Because you have to pay for the report. So it's very good. For, uh, I mean, I would recommend parents or suggest parents to ask uh, the clinic before you engage in anything. Okay, some, they provide uh, initial consultation with no charges. Uh, feel free to ask them as many questions as possible. I guess uh, from there, you can know what to expect uh, from that assessment, like what uh, Liana has explained everything in one, uh, the, the process of the assessment, how long of the assessment or each session. Uh, the process that can break down into a few sessions de depending on uh, what type of assessment you go for, but definitely they will have initial consultation. And then uh, she will talk about um, uh, recommendation after the assessment and what to do what's next okay and also always ask how much does it cost okay if, if you if you worried about cost ask them and then uh, that's where you can ask also like what to do next because it's expensive so this is where uh, the clinical psychologist can direct you to the right person or to the right place okay it's okay to ask them that okay you don't need to like you know, don't need to worry about like, oh, I shouldn't ask her. Then after the session, you feel bad for not asking. So, uh, so take the opportunity to ask as many questions as possible because uh, personally, I do that as well. When I go see a doctor, if I have a flu, I will ask a lot of questions, okay? Because I want, I, for me, I want to know why. So same goes to parents out there or teachers or anyone. If you're looking for assessment, please ask as many uh, questions as possible. And then move to next is uh, just now we heard that uh, Ms. Liana talked about interviewing family members. It's the style of the assessment. Okay. Uh, this is what I want to talk about uh, stakeholders. Okay. If you, if you see uh, not only business, if you're talking about stakeholders in health professional, we do talk about stakeholders as well. So what are the stakeholders? Basically, is who are the one that taking care of the child or who are involved in this child's uh, therapy or assessment or intervention. So when we do planning, we need to know, we need to identify who are the stakeholders. One of the most important one that I always tell parents is the caregivers. Sometimes the, okay, sometimes the child, you are the parents of this child, but you may not be the primary caregiver. Why? Because you're working out skirt, your child is with uh, the grandparents then the grandparents will be the primary caregiver. Why? Because you're working outside, you only come back once a week and so forth. So this is where uh, I would tell uh, all the viewers today that it's really important. And sometimes, please do not get offended if I ask you to ask, like, can I see your mother-in-law? It's not that <laughs> I want to ask her something else or what. It's just that because to me, uh, I always tell this to parents that, okay, um, you all can come together, whoever that uh, taking care of that person, uh, please attend uh, the initial consultation. Why? Uh, because I want to know uh, your point of view and the parent's point of view, because the one that taking care of the child definitely will see more. Okay, no offense. I'm not trying to offend anyone. I'm not trying to ask more questions from different, but basically I assume that in your situation, Liana, you will be the same, right? 
Yes, yes, that's right. Sometimes when when uh, you mentioned about the parents need to be in the session, right? Um, I often also uh, experience that um, because of the wife is busy or due to work, she's not able to present, but because they had made an appointment, so the father attend the session instead. So when I ask questions about the child, the probably the father could not answer as much as the mother would. So that would also affect and that would take more time for me to assess. So probably I would also ask the mother to attend the next session or both of them to attend the next session. So it's going to take more time. So the intake interview will take another session. So it takes instead of one session. So it has extended to two sessions. So that would cost more on the parents. So just parents out there, just be aware if you want to come for an assessment or a consultation, make sure to attend for those who, who has taken, uh, who has given time, a lot of time to the child, make sure you attend so that you can answer questions from the clinical psychologist or counselors or whoever that is present there for you. So that's, uh, that is uh, one of the expectations as well. Before you engage in any assessment, uh, who are the water taking care? Sometimes we ask this, uh, to be honest, uh, no offense. We are not trying to like, like saying that, well, this person is better than the other person. No, we are just want to know who are the ones that are taking care. Yes, you are the parents, but... Who has moment, more experience with the child. Correct. This experience in terms of like, Direct experience, Direct not like experience. not like experience, experience. Okay, <laughs> so you have because you are taking care. Definitely, you experience the child more than those who doesn't uh, provide care. Or you know, this is what we call a secondary caregiver. Primary is the one that giving constant care. Um, secondary. So um, sometimes it might sound harsh, like oh, you're the primary, I'm the secondary. But the secondary is the parents. The primary is the grandparents. That to, you know, uh, don't take it in a negative way. This is just how we want to know, uh, how we gain information from you. Okay, uh, like an example where Miss Liana say that you know the assessment CARS CAS assessment for autism can go as young as one and a one and a half years old. Same goes to counseling. You know, sometimes I have parents who like, oh, I think my child needs counseling. Yeah, we do a lot of talking, but if the child won't talk then there will be no therapy. This is what I always tell parents. That's, that's why it's very important for us. Like if the child don't talk, can I talk to someone else instead? Okay, it's not that, you know, I'm choosing side or I'm picking side. It's just that this is how we, through talking or through interviewing, this is how we do assessment or screening. Okay, this is just a expectation for parents, cause uh, stakeholders, like, you know, who are the one that going to be in there. And then um, if the person couldn't attend, uh, then it will prolong the assessment, which will uh, incur higher costs uh, for uh, the treatment. Okay, and then uh, that's why you can see these term stakeholders: primary caregiver, secondary caregiver. You know, a lot of these questions. Uh, if you don't understand, please do ask. Um, I mean, um, we are more than happy to help or, or to to ask. I like to explain to you what is it. I same goes to other like hospital. Feel free to ask. Okay, and this, from there, uh, you can see that this is basically from the point of view of a psychologist. And then the next one will be uh, when parents talk about treatment. Okay, this is what uh, Liana has uh, summed up just now, which is quite good. She tells us everything <laughs> about when diagnosis to, you know, how long, what's the process, how many sessions. No more then... secrets from my side. <laughs> Correct. And then towards <laughs> the end, which is recommendation. Recommendation, it can be a treatment planning. It is a, tri uh, a treatment planning way. They recommend you what to do with the schools or what to do. And then uh, that's where stakeholders include, like if your child need an OT for fine motor skills, she said that just now, uh, FMS, fine motor skill, then she will recommend you to go for, it, uh, for an OT, okay, an uh, occupational therapy session. Then from there, OT can get information from Liana and then they can work together. These are also considered the stakeholders. Okay, like for your child, let's just say your child uh, uh, in the company, okay, these are the stakeholders that will work in with your child and OT, uh, a clinical psychologist. And then normally at the end of the report recommendation, that's where uh, the clinical psychologist, like what Liana explained, will give you the direction what to do next. 
If you're not sure after the session, I believe that you can call back the clinic and ask. I'm not sure about this part. Can you explain? Maybe the clinical psychologist uh, will set an appointment to see you with or without charges. I'm not sure. So this is where you can ask them. Okay. Sometimes for my session, um, I allow parents to record what I say. Why? Because sometimes I talk too much, they can't write down. So I was like, okay, you know what? You can just record what I say and then they can listen and play it back uh, what to do next. Okay, so this is what Liana has said just now. Towards the end, you have a recommendation what to do next. So by doing after the class, because today we, uh, the main topic is about autism. So autism, they can affect you in different aspects of life. Sometimes it needs another assessment or separate assessment because CARS assessment is only to find out autism. Yes or no? Do my child has autism? Then you go for CARS, which is what uh, Liana explained. There's two types, GARS and B, uh, CARS. This is what she preferred to use. From there, this assessment itself can only tell you yes or no to the question of do my child has autism? Okay, and then from there, she explained also, she will uh, recommend or suggest to parent what to do next. Uh, we do uh, behavior or uh, developmental milestone to see what are the delays. And then after that, from the delays, you can see in terms of fine motor skills, speech, if speech test delay, speech therapy. If the fine motor skill or sensory issue or daily living, activity daily living, is also one component inside, right? then this is all under occupational therapy, okay? And then the latest, or not the latest, is this behavior. Uh, clinical psychologists can address, or there's another therapy that can do, which is behavior therapy to address the behavior issues. So these are the recommendation or uh, the treatment plan or the intervention planning at the end of the session, which is covered uh, by your clinical psychologist. So please, uh, parents uh, or, or anyone that if you decide uh, to send your child uh, to for an assessment, please do us. And also um, uh, recommendation, uh, also one more thing that uh, uh, Ms. Liana talked about is government hospital, correct? So yes. I be so I believe you can also look for uh, clinical psychologists in government. Yes, yes. Usually in, in government hospital, um, the psychiatrist, the child psychiatrist would go for the screening, right? Mm -hmm. So it's been recommended for the, uh, from the child psychiatrist to see that, okay, uh, from the medical perspective and also the, um, the biological perspective, so there are um, significant uh, affecting the brain of the child. So they would recommend for the clinical psychologist to do the assessment. All right, and then they assess the, the clinical psychologist would do the assessment with whatever that was mentioned just now by me. So, mm -hmm. and then the same procedures. So that would be the process. So probably from KK, um, go to see MO and when MO would uh, point you out to the child psychiatrist and the child psychiatrist would point you out to the clinical psychologist in the hospital. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, sorry, we have one question. I just sure. saw, I'm so sorry, it's towards the end. Okay, uh, from Miss Jesse, my son is non-verbal. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you assess him if he can't answer the questions? I feel he really need a psychologist consultation for us to understand him better. He mm -hmm. was not formally diagnosed as autistic or cerebral palsy, I assume, CP, not, mm -hmm. clinical, not clinical psychologist, right? <laughs> okay, autistic or CP. Uh, where, where can I find you, Ms. Tiana? Or is there a link or list of clinical psychologists? Uh, okay, Ms. Jesse, it's good. We're going to break it. First, uh, he can't answer the question, how do you access him? Okay, how old is the child? Did, did she mention? Nope. No, okay. Like say, uh, take it for example, if the child is six years and below, right? If the child is not able to... Um, to, to, to speak or to verbally say things, right? So one thing, whether we want to know whether the child understand instructions or not, all right? So if the child is able to understand instructions, for example, not just the familiar instructions. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, uh, uh, yeah. just replied. 16 years old, teenager, 16. non-verbal. 16, one six. Okay, one six, all right. So if 
if it's a teenager, then um, nonverbal means that not being able to say words. All right, not not by um, by purposely not saying things. All right, so mm. if it's nonverbal means that cannot pronounce or cannot speak very well means that you need to go to see speech therapy all right but if the child is or if the teenager your child is able to understand things right yes. so it means that yeah. can see can answer huh? mm -hmm. <laughs> a very fast one <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. if the if, if your child can understand uh, can say yes or no can see whether what they want or what not say but show what they want or not all right so if it's a teenager they can show it by the, their behaviors right do you like this mm -hmm. Okay, do you want to do this? Mm -hmm. All right. So if they're able to do that, all right, then we can work with, like, say, for example, emotional regulations and whatnot, uh, being able to communicate during, like, uh, different sign, maybe um, packs or sign language. But that would be more under, um, that would be more under occupational therapy uh, or speech therapy. So if it's difficulty in terms of medically, or biologically that's uh, preventing them from, from uh, being able to verbally express, then you would have to see a medical doctor to get it checked, all right? So if there's no problem with the medical or uh, biological issues, then you would have to go to the speech therapy. If it's regarding to the emotional regulation, maybe you can see a, uh, a counselor or clinical psychologist, you know, or sometimes occupational therapy can also help with emotional regulation. So it's your choice where you want to send, but make sure that you know what is the issue. So let's say, for example, you don't know what is the, the, the foundation of the issue of your child, right? So go for a screening, go see a clinical psychologist, go see a, a, a psychiatrist, you know, get it checked first so that we know what are the foundations. Like I mentioned earlier, we need to look at several uh, developmental milestones, whether, whether we know whether this child can do this or cannot do this. So that is where we can direct you one by one. So I cannot explain to you and give you directly here because when there's a lot of things that we need to cover, right? I can just give you um, a brief uh, assumption of what you can do and where you can look for, right? I hope you understand that. Yep, yep. So yeah, so uh, Jesse, yeah, you can go for screening or schedule an uh, uh, initial uh, consultation with us. You can find uh, Miss Liana with us, uh, Mind Story. If you look at our page, we have our uh, uh, phone number and you can you know, contact us uh, for uh, initial, uh, because it's really big, you know, there's a lot of things that we need to consider before we give any assessment. We need to understand your child's situation. Uh, and then also, uh, second thing is, yes, there's a list of clinical psychologists. It's called MSCP, Malaysian Society of Clinical Psychology. You can go in and there's a list of who is the re uh, uh, registered member of that society. Okay, and then the second one is, can I know if a child will cry and don't allow parents to talk on the phone or face-to-face, -face, is it under the spectrum? Will throw things on the floor, but once finished talk, will not throw things or cry. Is it the child want us to pay attention to her or is in the spectrum? Four-year-old child. All right, so the child would uh, throw tantrum. Yeah. Well, there's a second part, four-year-old child. Uh, the child last time scared of strangers, but now after early intervention program, yes, she has improved. Uh, no longer scared of strangers, but getting very friendly to others. Uh, it is an improvement or being too friendly is also a problem in a spectrum. All right. Like I said, um, it's difficult for me to explain here because there's a lot of aspects that I need to cover. All right. So like I mentioned just now, we need to look at the criteria, the main criteria. All right. It has to be ongoing and it has to prolong and you know, those are the certain things that I need to know, the information. I need to know the intensity, I need to know the frequency, so, and, and the period. So I need to know what causes that behavior. Like I said, uh, during my consultation, I would ask whether if that 
that behavior or, or is shown because of other factors and not because of neurodevelopmental issues, you know? So those are the things I need to screen first. So it's difficult for me to say yes or no here um, because I don't want to give a, a wrong impression towards uh, the child's behavior. So I really hope you do understand that. So if you want to know further why your child is behaving certain way, is it for attention? Is it because of new developmental issues? So I think it's, it's appropriate for you to seek um, help for, uh, to the appropriate uh, person. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So and uh, the second part, uh, I would say that if uh, for EIP, early intervention program, whether it's improvement, or is it a problem of a spectrum? This one, you can speak to the person that provide the EIP. Uh, they have the direction. They have certain goals. Like for example, uh, at this age, uh, your child will have to uh, achieve certain goals. Okay? And then they work from it. Then you can see uh, whether is it uh, a progress or is it something that fall in the spectrum of autism. Okay, so. Uh, also, another thing that um, the criteria of uh, autism is based, uh, it's from the criteria uh, 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 guideline that on a trained clinical psychologist, uh, uh, they have to define it in, uh, well, you have to define it uh, and you are trained to uh, observe this kind of behavior. For me or anyone else who are not trained in clinical psychologists, if we see the event is just one off or one or two, three days, uh, you can ask, but I would not suggest immediately put it under the spectrum because uh, you know it needs some time to develop. But uh, it's good that you ask, so we can let you know. Uh, but like what Ms. Liana said also, uh, it's we, we can't really say that whether it's attention or is it under the spectrum. Um, but please talk to the EIP people because they uh, they will certainly tell you and guide you. Okay, all right. Uh, I get, we already at, the, at four o'clock at the end of this uh, uh, Facebook Live. Um, thanks for joining us today. If you have any questions that we couldn't answer now, uh, you can put in a comment or you can contact us uh, at uh, our Facebook page. You can just comment under the video or you can contact us uh, on our number that provided. Uh, for those who are looking for autism assessment, uh, you can find Miss Liana with uh, us at Mind Story. You can schedule an appointment to see here for initial consultation. Okay, and here we do provide uh, assessment for autism, which is CARS CAS. Okay, and then from there, after the assessment, she will recommend what to do next. Okay, thank you for attending our Facebook Live. Uh, and then do check out our page for our next live. Uh, we, we're going to talk about other types of. Uh, uh, special needs, okay, or neurodevelopmental or emotional behavior. Uh, do check out our uh, page. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Liana, for your time today. Thank you so much, Harry, for having me. Thank you, my sorry. All right, see you on the next uh, Facebook Live. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. -bye.